Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. My name is Paula Oral and I'm a white female with brown hair and a flowery shirt. And I'm sitting in front of some shelves at my desk and I am the new director of the National Network for Contemporary Visual Arts, CVAM. Truly welcome to everyone joining a very important event today. Before I start, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Russ Andrews. We're joined by Russ, who will be doing our BSL interpretation for the event today. Please pin Russ to your screen if you'll be accessing his interpretation. You can do this by clicking the blue dots at the top right hand corner of your frame, at, sorry, of his frame and select pin video. Russ has asked me to audio describe him as a white male, graying beard, bald and wearing a white t-shirt with a blue background. There is an also also an option to access closed captions for this session. You can access this by clicking the transcript CC button at the bottom of your screen and then show subtitles. If you have any technical issues, if you need any support, please feel free to message CVAN in the chat. This event is being recorded and all panelists will also describe themselves before they present. Thank you, Russ, for joining us today as well. So this is the last event in a six month program working with a National Visual Arts Alliance to bring together a value case for our art form. Our aim as a national network for contemporary visual arts through the Art is Essential campaign has been to provide a space where we hear from colleagues and represent our values, and also most critically come together to feel united. In this time, we have experienced a situation where the government has begun an autocratic retain and explain policy. This policy has been to approach is to contextualizing controversial monuments and historic statues, provoking culture wars and an anti-woke agenda, including a policy advising the Office for Students to devalue courses in price group C1, covering subjects in music, dance, drama, performing arts, art and design, media studies, and archeology. span they're, they're among the strategic priorities that they are proposing for a subsidy cut and put forward it, they have put forward a case to devalue the subject at higher education level. Alongside these points, there've been so many disgraceful approaches to policy development, especially in relation to equality, diversity, inclusion. I personally can't tell you how disheartening, angry and concerned I am. I am also very confused as on one hand, there is substantial funding for the arts from department culture and media and sport. On the other hand, these are polarizing policies and agitation. So the Visual Arts Alliance will set out its formal ask to the government this autumn. The government's comprehensive spending review will set out the budget for the next three years. Today, through this event, we want you to tell us in the form of a placard what you need and what you want from the government. So please post a picture of your placard and social media, use the, the hashtag art is essential, be creative with your placards, say why art is essential to you in the body of the post and tag others, encourage them to do the same. For a unified message on your social posts, begin with art is essential and be sure to use the hashtag. We are joined by an incredible panel of wonderful artists and art workers today who will present their own ask. In order, we have our Alliance colleague, Sandra Booth, who is the director of the Council for Higher Education in Art and Design, 
and provide a voice for on behalf of the higher education art and design sector in the UK four nations, advancing knowledge and understanding the sector and promoting the sex sector's interest to others. Bob and Roberta Smith see art as an important element in democratic life. In 2013, Bob and Roberta launched the Arts Party with Crescent Arts in Scarborough. The Art Party seeks to better advocate to the, um, sorry, better advocate the arts to the government. The Art Party is not a formal political party, but is a loose grouping of artists and organisations who are deeply concerned about the government's diminishing role of the arts and, and design in schools. Bob and Roberta couldn't be here today, but in the end, he has. Um, we are going to play a pre-recorded film um, of his contribution. We are joined also by emerging artist Louise Hall, who is a UK-based multidisciplinary artist and that focuses on performance, printmaking and sculpture to explore conversations on post-colonial ideas about the Black British experience in the UK and diaspora. We're delighted to have Louise join us as a recent graduate and winner of the 2020 Platform Award through the CVAN South East Network. If you live in the Southwest and interested in really radical youth programmes, we're joined by Rising Arts Agency based in Bristol. They're an incredible young person collective led by young creative thinkers and that adv advocate for sector and cultural change through campaigns, research projects, industry consultation, and our creative agency services. Kamina Walton is one of the founding directors and has crafted a progressive approach to organizational development through mentoring the next generation of leaders. Yuella Jackson is the forthcoming young person director and Kamina has been working alongside Yuella for the last three years, supporting training and learning from each other. Jade Montserrat is a brilliant artist whose research-led practice excavates shared histories alongside exploring her own personal narrative. Jade works at the intersection of art and activism through painting, performance, film, sculpture, installation, print and text. She integrates these mediums with the aim to expose gaps in our visual and linguistic ha habits. Jade is also the recipient of the Stuart Hall Foundation Scholarship which supports her PhD and the development of her work from her Black diasporic perspective in the north of England. I cannot tell you how delighted I am to hold this space with you and share our placards online today and feel united with all of you. So handing over to my colleague, Sandra Booth, thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thanks for that introduction and scene setting, which I'm going to build on um, a little bit more now for the, the benefits of the, the audience. So good morning. I'm delighted to join everyone on the digital march today. And it really does feel united. It feels unified and that we're all speaking with one voice across the Visual Arts Alliance and the creative education sector. So my name is Sandra Booth. I'm a white woman with dark shoulder length hair. I'm in my mid fifties. I'm from a working class background in the Northwest of England. My pronouns are she and her. I'm wearing a white embroidered cotton top today because I'm very hot <laughs> um, and I'm wearing glasses uh, for reading. I work for the Council for Higher Education in Art and Design who represent 66 higher education institutions and 680 individual artists and art education educators, our members who teach art and design and related subjects in the university sector across the four nations. I've got my placard here and I've been tweeting it. I'll read it out. <laughs> my one ask of government is that they consistently across all departments acknowledge and reinstate arts as strategically important sectors and subjects. This, I believe, would unlock prioritisation in policy decisions and investment in a joined up way across government 
to deliver us the understanding and recognition our vital contribution we make to communities and the wider economy. I will provide a full transcript of what I'm about to say, as I will need to keep referring to my notes, and I do provide some technical details about the current situation in higher education and the context to our discussions today. I was the first in my family to go to university where I studied drama and performing arts. Back then, I was fortunate enough to receive a full grant to study a subject of my choice, to live in London and to always find temporary employment in the holidays to help sustain me. Sadly, in the current climate, with the decline of provision and access to arts education, these sorts of opportunities and choices are not as available and not as inclusive as we would like them to be. I went on to gain meaningful graduate employment, sadly not within the theatre, but in my second choice career in marketing and communications, and later in higher education, where I worked in external engagement. I continued to engage in and support all forms of the arts and in particular the theatre. And I, I undertook caring responsibilities, volunteering for several charities, but I also have worked for over 30 years, paying my taxes and contributing. So I really do feel that over that length of time, I have repaid the investment the government made in my education. As have many people here today, and the many hundreds and thousands of people who work in the arts sector in this country. So why does it feel like a constant battle to prove our value to the current government in order not to be overlooked and deprioritised, particularly in my area of experience, which is arts education and the development of the creative talent pipeline? I would like us all to continue to work together to ensure we support the current and next generations coming through. Employment rates demonstrate that creative graduates are integral to the UK's creative industries. Graduates represent 46% of those working in the creative industries. And this figure rises considerably when examining certain subsectors. For example, 82% of graduates work in design and 78% of those working in music, performing and the visual arts have a creative degree, as do 75% of those working in architecture. Therefore, creative arts education courses must not face cuts or the government is being strategically short-sighted and risks undermining its own ambitions for the regeneration of our high streets, local community cohesion and sustainability, and the global opportunities, including creative and digital technologies. As we all know, creative industries are crucial drivers of growth, growing at four times the rate of the UK economy as a whole, creating jobs at three times the rate of the UK average, employing two million people across all nations and regions, and contributing 116 billion in GVA in 2019. That's a greater contribution than the aerospace, automotive, life sciences and oil and ga gas sectors combined. The creative industries are a growing and dyna dynamic sector, positioning the UK at the forefront of international competitiveness. Up until recently, this value was recognized in the government's former industrial strategy with a sector deal, the cultural recovery program and the recent plan for growth where the creative industries were highlighted as a priority sector. Yet recently there's been another U-turn impacting on the arts education sector and a reclassification of arts subjects as not a strategic priority. This has happened within the Office for Students and the Department for Education in England, who are looking to cut 
the recurrent funding teaching grant subsidy for high cost subjects, including art and design by 50% in order to divert more funding to STEM and health related subjects. It's important to unpack the extent of the proposed changes for this audience. Some reporting has implied that the Office for Students is proposing a 50% cut in the level of overall funding for students on arts courses. This is not the case. Universities and colleges will continue to receive the full tuition fee loan for students on these courses. That's up to £9,250 per annum for now, but we need to protect and watch this space. The proposed reduction relates to a much smaller subsidy that is currently provided by the OFS, which is designed to help universities and colleges deliver subjects that are expensive to teach. For art subjects, this subsidy currently works out at around £243 per full-time student per year. It is paid to the universities and colleges and not given directly to students. Under the proposals, this subsidy would be reduced by 50% to £121.50 per student per year. And that's equivalent to a reduction of around 1% of the combined tuition fee and OFS funding. However, whilst for some institutions, this might appear to only have a moderate impact, these courses are not cheap to deliver. The provision of industry standard creative education and collaborative partnerships with cultural organisations, museums and galleries includes high costs because it involves technical facilities, studio space, expert technicians and expensive reinvestment, continuous investment in updating technologies. The proposed 50% reduction therefore would impact the quality and ex extent of provision. I've just noticed in the chat, people are asking for the transcript and I'm going to circulate it immediately after um, I've finished speaking. I only finished writing it up last night because I wanted to see if there were any anything that happened in 24 hours that I needed to update, but I will make sure everybody's got a copy. Alongside this, the Office for Student plans to increase funding for specialist institutions from 43 million to 53 million. And whilst this is welcome, it does not offset the overall erosion of vital funding streams. The OFS has a fixed and limited funding budget that is set annually by central government. And that budget is used to support an array of activities from providing additional funding for medicine and nursing degrees, supporting disadvantaged students, funding to support student mental health, which has been seriously affected in the pandemic. The government has also highlighted professional shortages in scientists, engineers, medical and dental practitioners, nurses and midwives, and it is pursuing a specific strategy of supporting STEM and healthcare subjects. However, what about our subject areas? It shouldn't be a zero sum game and we shouldn't be pitting arts against STEM and health. Arts and artists contribute to both these sectors. An organisation such as McKinsey Consulting have found that those organisations that combine arts and science skills are 10% more productive and have 6% higher employment growth. And we have many advocates in the STEM areas who would support the Art is Essential campaign. The government have also identified persistent skill shortages in our sector within the creative and related sectors. So to attack and ultimately cut off the pipeline of talent is counterproductive and contradictory to the government's own ambitions as set out in the skills white paper. And we choose to re reveal this back to them. The Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre based at Nesta 
has additionally recently identified that there are skills shortages which are particularly problematic for those in crafts, museums, galleries and libraries, IT, software and computer services in the creative economy and architecture. So what's happening in universities? Whilst many in our sector saw these decisions coming, and as we are creative and resilient leaders, we have yet again pivoted, adapted, in order to minimize the impact on staff and students. And we're currently absorbing these cuts within existing budgets and our resource planning. However, what we are deeply worried about is that we feel that this signals a trajectory of worse to come in the autumn with the comprehensive spending review and the conclusion of the auger review on student fees and finances. We see this policy as counterintuitive, counterproductive, and it indicates further evidence of the disjuncture between the Department for Education and DCMS and the lack of coordination across Bayes, Health and other departments. Most worryingly, Treasury, who we need to continue to convince. Creative and education skills are still clearly undervalued by politicians and governments and those in power, despite the many campaigns delivered in recent years. And although progression has been made in such areas as the cultural recovery programme, the creative industry sector deal, the arts premium and the brilliant work by NSEAD and CVAN and others, our impact has been piecemeal and short lived rather than the strategic and sustained prioritisation that we need for our sector the wider economy and for society. Currently, government thinking has resulted in the deprioritization of creative subjects in the English curriculum, and this threatens higher creative education through counterintuitive policy and a lack of recognition of the importance of creative skills and the contributions made by our graduates as we build our post pandemic and post Brexit recovery. Creative roles now make up 30% of the government shortage occupation list and include many of the jobs cited as being very likely to grow as a share of the workforce by 2030 by virtue of being resistant to automation. 87% of highly creative roles in the UK are at low to no risk of being automated. Drawing your attention to these proposals in the consultation, they threaten to make studying creative works the preserve of a small group of elite students. This is completely contrary to the government's levelling up agenda and will damage access and participation, diversity and inclusion. These courses provide a vital pipeline of talent for creative and related industries and an important pathway for students from low participation backgrounds to access careers within the creative arts and beyond. If the consultation intends to address challenges for students arising from the corona pandemic, then cutting funding to arts and media courses seems an odd way to go about it. There are existing concerns about underrepresentation in the creative industries, and research suggests that the impact of the pandemic will only exacerbate existing structural inequalities. Higher education creative courses have comparatively strong diversity figures in some areas. For example, one in 10 students who accept a place on arts courses indicated that they had a disability. This is substantially higher than the one in 20 average for higher education courses more broadly. Women are also strongly represented with 63% of arts sector courses acceptances identifying as women, which is 9% greater than the overall higher education rate. 
any cut in funding would undermine the value of creative courses and make it more difficult for higher education institutions to continue their creative offerings. The knock-on effect of this is likely to compromise the diversity of the talent pipeline into the creative industries, further compound, compounding inequalities that our higher education institutions are working to address. There is still clearly a belief held amongst some of those in power that creative education is not essential. And in a worst case scenario, if the treasury view prevails that higher education creative graduates do not earn enough to fully pay back their loans, particularly in the short term until they are established in their chosen career, this is seen as a burden to the taxpayer. But nobody's asked the taxpayer. The taxpayer may be happy with this subsidy because of the value and the return on investment the individual taxpayer receives in their communities. In the current system, where value has been measured purely on salary metrics, creative, educa creative education underperforms. Creative education and skills are valued far more in the devolved nations, but members in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are also feeling the impact from central fiscal and policy decisions. Creative courses offered at UK higher education institutions are to be celebrated. They are internationally renowned. In the world subject rankings in 2021, seven UK institutions were ranked in the top 50 for art and design, eight for communications and media, and 13 institutions for performing arts. The success of these courses is vital in equipping creative graduates with the skills they need. The proposed reduction in funding could therefore also have serious implications for the UK's international reputation, competitiveness, and our ability to attract global talent. So in concluding, alongside the Visual Arts Alliance, we are strongly opposed to any proposals which see funding cuts to high cost subjects within the creative arts education portfolio. If we are to reverse the downward spiral of disinvestment in arts subjects, we must now give strategic focus to our advocacy in the broader context of the UK wide case for the value for creative education skills. The top three priorities that have consensus and hold appeal with policymakers are Britain leads the world in art and culture and must retain this competitive advantage, which remains a major export market. Big tech, career tech, a greener economy and innovation are growth pillars that the government is backing. Visual arts contribute to all these agendas. Society has been fractured by Brexit, the pandemic, nationalism, and culture has an important role to play in social justice and building a new sense of identity. Our advocacy needs to appeal to one or all of these objectives if it is to cut through and our collective voices to be heard. I'll end here by repeating my ask, reinstate our strategically important subjects. Thank you for your time this morning, and I'll now hand over to the video from Bob and Roberta Smith. Hello. Hello. I'm uh, Bob and Roberta Smith. My pronouns are uh, um, a white man, middle aged man, standing in a studio in. Ramsgate. And uh, this is uh, a message of solidarity in advance of the contemporary visual art networks, CVADS uh, uh, digital march on Thursday. So I'm saying solidarity to you all. Art is essential. And one of the ideas of the, uh, the CVAD digital march is to make placards. So I thought I'd show you a couple 
that I've made in previous projects. So this is a very traditional sort of <laughs> placard with a slogan on it. It says, Fodorito di Picture e Bellari. It's, uh, you, you know, uh, it's your right to uh, paint and dance. So that was for a project in Bologna. And uh, placards don't always, don't at all need to be against things. They don't need to be lambasting Gavin Williamson. Although, cutting uh, funding to art education by 50% uh, from the government is a ludicrous thing to do for higher education. But this is saying, uh, it's back to front <laughs> for you, but it says, uh, I believe in Michael Rosen. And uh, I painted that when Michael Rosen got sick. You'll be pleased to know that these placards don't carry slogans, so they're not going to be a back to front for you. This is the Toll Puddle Mountain Tree for a project that uh, I did with the National Trust in, I think it was in 2018, and we got uh, hundreds of children, well, not, maybe not hundreds of children, maybe a hundred children, to make placards of the uh, Toll Puddle Mountain Tree, which we displayed and marched with some of them with the uh, union movement in Toll, in Toll Puddle in Dorset. And then artists around the world, artists around the world get locked up for even thinking about doing what we're going to do on Thursday. Uh, so this is Ashraf Fayed, who was given a death sentence in 2016. It was commuted to eight years and 800 lashes. If the 800 lashes were ever carried out, that would get him. He's a poet. He wrote a satirical, satirical poem about the Saudi royal family. And that's what happened to him. I went to an exhibition that he curated at the Venice Biennale the year before. It's the wrong thing to happen to artists and poets. This is uh, uh, Naima Abban Kwaran. She's a Somali poet uh, given a three year sentence for similar act of poetic disobedience. And then this is, she's not a poet or an artist, not like now of, but this is Nasli uh, Zagari Radcliffe. Art is about speaking out, and that's why I'm happy to show, give you this message of solidarity Sivan and everybody who is demanding that the arts be uh, taken more seriously in primary school, in secondary school, and in university and in society more generally. Art is your human right. Thank you. Thank you very much for passing on to me. Hi everyone, I'm Louise Hall. Um, I will start with an audio description. So I'm 23 years old. I'm a woman of colour of Jamaican and British heritage. I have brown Afro hair. I'm wearing dangly earrings. I'm wearing a rainbow cardigan, a grey jumper and a white shirt. I have a, I have a blue digital background with Art is Essential written on. So as a recent graduate of the education system, and as student union president myself, I believe arts education is essential and I believe arts is essential. I would like to touch on the idea of arts education needing to change and to develop to foster a more inclusive environment. I think art education has had an amazing effect, an amazing impact as Sarah has well spoken about earlier. Arts education and education is a vital tool to be used to transform society. Education is shown to be necessary. It's shown it can change the way we discuss things, the way we use Instagram to share a message as we saw in the last 18 months. Education should be accessed by all, 
it shouldn't be for the few. And our education is no exception to this. We show by art and creative individuals that we can creatively problem solve, inspire and empower and make change. We show that we can stand up and support each other and make networks to ask the government and ask for change within our society. We know art is a tool for education, empowering and inspiring. If we know this, arts education and higher education, we know needs to change. We know arts education doesn't represent all the voices and we need to look at how we can. Students shouldn't feel invisible in our arts education system. They should feel empowered to create work that discusses different themes and discusses what, what they want to speak about, whether that's themselves and identity politics or something far from it. They should not feel like they have to be challenged or fight to be recognized and seen. We want an arts education that represents all these voices, that when you're in the space, you will feel seen and heard. This can't wait. Change needs to happen now. This isn't a change that has been you know, sudden and overnight, we have asked and we have waited. We know that change can happen. The message is clear. We need to decolonize arts education. We know arts education is essential and essential for change. This is an urgent message. It is vital. We cannot wait and we cannot start in 20 years time. We must start now. And we need to have these conversations now and we need to make action. We can use us as a collective force, use the art sector to change how education is seen, how education is talked about, to reform and to decolonize, to truly transform our sector, but society. We know arts education plays a role in how society views art and how we discuss different topics throughout our society. So arts education needs to be made an inclusive and safe space. And it needs to be now for everyone. So my final message and what I would ask for the government is to make arts education a safe space and to make all our voices heard and felt valid within in the space. So thank you very much for listening and I'll be passing on to Paula next. Great, we're handing on to Kamina. Thank you, Paula. Um, hi, everybody. My name is I've got uh, shoulder length, mousy coloured hair, and I'm wearing black rimmed glasses, a black t-shirt, and I'm in a small workroom with a very crowded bookshelf behind me. Um, so uh, I am here representing Rising Arts Agency. Rising Arts Agency is a genuinely youth-led social enterprise run by creative thinkers aged 18 to 30. Our mission is to empower Bristol's underrepresented young talent to fulfill their creative ambitions and affect radical social change through the arts. We're anti-establishment disruptors, co-created with and for young people. We are an arts agency made up of a diverse community of young people, including photographers, filmmakers, illustrators, designers, musicians, poets and theatre makers, to name but a few. Arts education has been a vital component of many of these young people's personal journeys. The images you are seeing are part of our Who's Future campaign, a public art event that took place in the midst of the pandemic across the streets of Bristol last year. It showcased the work of 37 young artists from our community and gave them the space to address some of the specific issues we've been grappling with head on through our work. These included racism, the climate crisis, access issues, transformative leadership, and young people's hopes for a secure and empowering future. We know that a priority for the Arts is Essential campaign is to ensure we protect access for all to high quality arts education. This is vital to sustaining the strength and diversity of our talent pipeline and ensuring a quality of opportunity. This access to quality arts education should be a fundamental human right. The arts are a key vehicle for ensuring everyone can have a voice, regardless of their social, economic or cultural background. 
we know that the cultural and creative sector is marked by significant exclusions of those from working class social origins, women and those from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Ensuring equitable access to quality arts education is essential. Employers are crying out for creative and critical thinkers and those who can work collectively and collaboratively. It's the arts training that's renowned for forging these skills. In a DCMS report published last year, and these figures are slightly different to Sandra's, so I'm not sure which are correct, the UK's creative industries were contributing almost 13 million pounds to the UK economy every hour. The creative industry sector was growing more than five times faster than the national economy. During the global crisis, the arts and creativity have helped us navigate uncertainty and been agents of hope. Almost 1 million people have been made redundant since the start of the pandemic. 53.7% of these were under the age of 25 and a further 24.5% under the age of 35. Many of these were creative industries jobs, highlighting particular concern around future inequality in the cultural and creative sector and potentially heralding a missing generation. In short, on our transformative cultural growth in this country, we need to value and invest in young artists and creatives. Getting involved with the arts can have powerful and lasting effects on health. It can help protect against a range of mental health conditions, help manage mental ill health and support recovery. Post pandemic, access to the arts will prove a vital resource. There is a huge body of research that illustrates how different kinds of cultural activity bring meaning to people's lives and exert powerful impacts on our society. The arts are a key tool for bringing together communities, building trust and amplifying those voices that are too often unheard. Artists play a vital role in this work, but they need access to skills and resources. Investment in creative arts education is key. Just to finish, the threat to arts education is yet another example of the government's undermining of the value the arts hold in our lives. We must fight this trend now. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, dissents speak to a future age. The greatest dissents do become court opinions and gradually, over time, their views become the dominant view. So that's the dissenters hope that they are writing not for today, but for tomorrow. Thank you. And I'd like to hand over to Jade Montserrat. Oh my gosh, Kamina, those um, posters are so beautiful. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Jade Montserrat. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a brown woman and I'm wearing a navy dress and gray cardigan. I may put my glasses on and take them off on occasion. I have back, um, my Afro hair tied back loosely on, on the top of my head in a scrunchie and bookshelves are visible behind me along with other clutter. Um, please excuse my basic reinforcement of the speeches that have come before. I'm indebted to my fellow and esteemed um, speakers for their eloquence. Um, art is essential for healthy, wealthy imaginations. Cutting funding from arts education demonstrates a distinct lack of imagination. To maximise our potential for shared humanity. We need access to resources and access to spaces that optimise and centre and stimulate our imaginations. This is where innovative, curious thinking happens and henceforth the growth of humanity. Without the combination of integrating, that is understanding that our education as a whole is underpinned by the thinking that art education specifically develops and recognizing the distinct and unequivocal benefits to our mental 
mental and physical health that art education maintains, there is the unavoidable danger that the capacity for imagining and innovation is strangled to obsolescence. Without access to an arts education that is available to everyone, there is certainty that the evolutions required for imaginations to flourish and create the conditions to shape new futures, creating the sustainable environments that we aspire to build, for example, will be suppressed. Without the tools to think creatively, without spaces to develop these tools and combine with other disciplines, disciplines that rely on the basic tenets that arts education brings, the futures we might assume can happen will not. And please let's not assume that they are tools that can be acquired anywhere else. Without the diverse mix of students that our society purports to prioritise in educational settings, the critical thinking required for innovative and creative thinking will be made obsolete. How can a discipline that would only be on offer to the upper middle classes serve the rest of society? It is precisely because art schools nurture in relation to one another that the potential for levelling up, as the Conservative Party has us speak, can happen. Without funding to progress that effort, that ambition is lost. Anyone on a lower income or from a family on low incomes rely on public funding to arts education. Art and art schools are essential for establishing and cherishing a plurality of belonging. Let's not pretend that art isn't already an elite field, and I'm grateful to my peers and those that come before me for continuing to fight to bring an awareness to the inequities that prevail. A 50% arts, uh, cut to arts education puts me and my peers and colleagues, as well as artists who have fought tirelessly all their lives, still in a perilous position, not least puts anyone pursuing a career in the arts off completely. I've been working in higher education art institutions as a visiting lecturer for a few years. I deliver lectures about my artwork, which I enjoy doing because it gives me an opportunity to understand my own work in the retelling of it. And with students who engage in a contextual and theoretical discussion, healthy for anybody who values learning. By cutting funding for arts education, I read that as severing the lifeblood from our souls and spirit and will determine that our future artists, rather than innovating, creating and storytelling, planting gardens, writing future favourite children's books and films and music and games and clothing, and I can go on, spend years having to constantly justify their legitimacy. What a barren, deathly, hollow landscape, one I recognise from Mark Fisher's description of how he uses the term capitalist realism. Capitalist realism and I I quote, as I understand it, cannot be confined to art or to the quasi propagandist way in which advertising functions. It is more like a pervasive atmosphere, conditioning not only the production of culture, but also the regulation of work and education and acting as a kind of invisible barrier constraining thought and action. Gavin Williamson, Secretary of State for Education and I were raised at roughly the same time in the same town, uh, and yet our, our outlook couldn't be further from each other, it would seem. I notice how out of touch he is from our, his hometown, um, uh, where we are priding ourselves on our creative thinking and work hard to make arts education an aspirational and, de and desirable route to steer one's life, especially since the declines in the town's previous industries. The suggestion that arts education funding is cut by 50% limits access for ordinary people here and nationwide. As a black Yorkshire woman, I note that by speaking beyond an economic or militaristic language with which to frame the societal dynamics we are confined by is anachronism and will land on deaf ears Will Williamson to hear it, but I will run the risk anyway. But as noted recently when I consulted friends as I prepped for the Council for Higher Education in Art and Design uh, with Sandra for their conference, finances and business strategies are at odds with care, respect, reciprocity. We reflected that we need to operate as human beings with care, with our hearts as part of communities. We reflected that we need to think about how we care for one another. I'm not sure how well this will land either, but in light of a proposed cut from uh, cut and how that will hit those without the entitlement that ease brings. I quote Bell Hooks from her book, Teaching to Transgress. We learned early that our devotion to learning, to a life of the mind, was a counter-hegemonic act, a fundamental way to resist every strategy of white racist colonisation. Foreclosure on colonial and imperial histories in my formal education is my driving force.
In reference to utopian visions transmitted through black music, Paul Gilroy articulates the pains with which creativity can retrieve life-sustaining lineages and refuse capitalism's means of production as conclusive to existence. Artistic, and I quote, artistic expression expanded beyond recognition from the grudging gifts offered by the masters as a token substitution for freedom from bondage, therefore becomes the means towards both individual self-fashioning and communal liberation. A further minimization and delegitimacy of arts education prompts me to recognize this as a way of shutting down the means to change society. And if ever there was a time to look beyond existing frameworks, and for that, the opportunity to pursue an arts education is essential for all, it is now. Is the Secretary of State for Education and his colleagues in government resistance to change beyond scarcity? Thank you. I'll uh, pass back to um, Paula. Wow, absolutely, absolutely incredible. I've got this sense of kind of shivers and feeling. Louise, Kamina, Jade, Sandra, thank you ever so much. And also agree with Lucy Day in the chat. You know, brilliant speeches and really backed up through evidence and, you know, really passionate, and passionate, passionate views. We really want you all to get on board with this campaign. We want you to post a picture of your placard on social media. We want you to use the hashtag art is essential. We want you to be creative with your placards and say why art is essential to you, to you, your family, your culture, your society. Tag others, encourage them to do the same. We are all totally blown away and this marks a really important moment for the Visual Arts Alliance and our network. So for everyone, this is my ask. This is my ask to the government, if you can read that. We'll put also Bob and Roberta's link to his film in the chat so you have it and you can watch it in your own time. Really honestly, thank you ever so much. Thank you to you, the audience, for being there, being with us, and being a really critical point of this campaign. CVAN is there for you, is there for the network of contemporary visual arts across, the, across England. It's there with our devolved nations in Wales, Scotland, and Ireland as well. So really, really thank you ever so much for your time and our speakers and the team Kate and Katie behind the scenes and Russ today. It has and is always an honour to work with you all. So thank you.